So now we would like to find the absolute value of the wave function squared. So from the last video, we found that the wave function is equal to this term over here. And here I've using this shorthand, I'm going to define this variable y just to save myself some time from having to write out all these constants all the time. So now we would like to find the absolute value of the wave function squared. And we know that this is equal to the conjugate of the wave function times the wave function. So in order to find this, we need to find the conjugate. And in order to find the conjugate, we need to take the conjugate of this entire term over here. So when we are trying to take the conjugate of this, of this whole term, what we're looking for actually are the individual conjugates of these two terms. We have this e term over here. So we need to take the conjugate of this term divided by the conjugate of this term. So question, first question you might, might, you might have is that why is the conjugate of this entire term equal to the individual conjugates of the numerator and the denominator? So in order to answer this question, you need to, you need to do some uh, complex number theory. So uh, I'm going to write out some complex number rules, so some of which I'm not going to prove due to I don't want to make this video too long. But if you have two complex numbers, a times b, and you take the entire conjugate, so this line here represents a conjugate. This is equal to the conjugate of a times the conjugate of b. And then if you have uh, 1 over z, where z is a complex number, and then you, so this is very poorly drawn. So 1 over z, z is a complex number, and you take this entire conjugate, then the conjugate of this term is equal to 1 over the conjugate of z. So if you have a divided by b, and you want to take the conjugate, then this is just equal to taking the conjugate of a times 1 over b which is equal to the conjugate of a times the conjugate of 1 over b, which is equal to the conjugate of a times 1 over the conjugate of b. So here you can see that I'm using this rule over here. And you can see that this is equal to conjugate of a divided by conjugate of b. So uh, <coughs> using, uh, using these results over here, since I know that the conjugate of a divided by b is equal to the conjugate of a divided by the conjugate of b, so now I know that the conjugate of the wave function is just equal to the conjugate of the numerator divided by the conjugate of the, of the denominator. So this is how I can arrive at this result. So now the next step is to solve, is to find the conjugate of both of these terms. So let's try to focus on the e term first. So we have e to the power of negative a x squared divided by 1 plus i y, and we would like to take the conjugate of this term. So here I'm going to introduce you to another rule. So you, if you have e to the power of z and you're taking the conjugate, so instead of z, let's, let's, write, it, let's write it out as a plus ib. So a and b are real numbers, and this whole thing is a complex number. So if I'm trying to take the conjugate of this entire thing, this whole thing is just equal to e to the power of a times e to the power of ib. So this is just equal to the conjugate of e to the power of a times the conjugate of e to the power of ib. So I'm just using this rule over here. And then this is just a real number, so the conjugate does nothing. And then thanks to Euler's formula, this is just equal to e to the power of negative ib. So you have a minus ib. So you can see that the conjugate of e to the power of some complex number is just equal to e to the power of the conjugate of that complex number. So you can write this rule out as this conjugate is just equal to e to the power of the conjugate of z. So using this rule over here, the conjugate of this term is just equal to the conjugate of this term, so just the exponent. And then as we found before, the conjugate of 1 over z is just equal to 1 over the conjugate of z. So in our case, our z is 1 plus iy. So using this rule over here, I can just turn this into the conjugate of 1 plus iy. And so in the end, we get e to the power of negative ax squared 1 minus iy. So this is how you can find the conjugate of this, this term over here. Now for this second term, we need to take the conjugate of a square root. So we need to take the conjugate of a square root of 1 plus i y. So to do this, let's just say that this thing here is equal to z. So we know that z squared is equal to 1 plus i y, right? So you just square this to take away the, take away the square root sign. And then if I take the conjugate of both sides, so the left-hand side is basically just z times z. Right, and you have this conjugate, and on the right-hand side, if I'm taking the conjugate, I get 1 minus i y. And on the left-hand side, the conjugate of two products is just equal to the taking the conjugate first and then taking the products. So this is I'm just using this rule over here. 
so minus 1 minus i y. So we know that the conjugate of z squared is actually equal to 1 minus i y. So the conjugate of z is equal to the square root of 1 minus i y. So you can see the conjugate of z is just equal to the square root of 1 minus i y. So, so the conjugate of z is really what I'm looking for. And in this case, I'm just taking the conjugate of 1 plus i y. So after you take the conjugate, it just becomes the square root of 1 minus i y. So for this term, if you take the conjugate, it just becomes 1 minus square root of 1 minus i y. So now we found the individual conjugates of the numerator and the denominator. So we can now try to substitute our results in. So this whole conjugate is equal to... So sometimes I'm using the star to represent a conjugate, sometimes I'm using a bar. It doesn't really matter what you use, it's just a matter of notation. So I hope that doesn't confuse you. So in the numerator, I'm just going to substitute in this term. So e to the power of negative ax squared divided by 1 minus i y. So this is the numerator, and the denominator I get the square root of 1 minus i y. And so now we're ready to find our probability density function. So recall that this is just the probability, den probability density function of where you will find your particle. So this is equal to the conjugate times itself. And so first, let's group up the, the, uh, co these constants. So I'm taking this term and I'm multiplying it by this term. So first, I can just group up the constants, 2 square root of 2a divided by pi. And then we have these e terms. We have e to the power of negative x squared, 1 minus iy, times e to the power of negative ax squared, 1 plus iy. And in the denominator, I have 1 plus iy, 1 minus iy. So now we need to simplify this term. So continuing with where we left off, so I'm just going to copy these constants out. And for the denominator, what we're going to get is the square root of 1 plus y squared. So I'm, all I'm doing is I'm using the identity a squared plus b squared is equal to a plus ib, a minus ib. So you can expand this to verify that this is indeed true. But using this identity, the the denominator just becomes the square root of 1 plus y squared. And then for the numerator, we get e to the power of negative ax squared, 1 minus iy. And I'm going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by 1 plus iy. So this is going to help us with our simplification later on. And then this is going to be multiplied by e to the power of ax squared, 1 plus iy. And then for this uh, exponent, I'm going to multiply the numerator and denominator by 1 minus iy. So carrying on. So once again, I'm using the same identity over here. And then you can see that the denominator just becomes 1 plus y squared. And we have 1 plus iy. And something similar just uh, happens over here. So the den denominator becomes 1 plus y squared. And then we have 1 minus iy. And then you can see that as these multiply together, the exponents just add, add up together. So I can just take this away and then just add up both of these terms. And then you can see that this iy, they both cancel out. So in the end, we're left with something rather pleasant. So I've left out the 1 plus y squared. So in the end, we're left with something that looks rather nice. We have e to the power of negative 2ax squared divided by 1 plus y squared. And in the denominator, I have square root of 1 plus y squared. So we're basically done here. So this is the answer. So now we would like to use this symbol that Griffiths gives us. He wants to define w as being equal to the square root of 1 plus these terms. And if you will recall, uh, in the in my video so far, I've actually defined this term as y. So we're going to let w be equal to the square root of a plus a divided by 1 plus y squared. So you can see that I've defined y in such a way. So our w would be equal to the square root of a divided by 1 plus y squared. So let's try to apply that to our solution over here. So we have this square root of 2 divided by pi, and then I'm going to pull this a outward uh, outside to combine with this 
1 plus y square and then for the for the exponent over here you can see that we have a square root of a divided by 1 plus y square squared times x squared so you can see that I'm just taking the square root and then squaring it so what this means is that since this term over here this is going to be equal to w which is what Griffiths wants us to use so now I can rewrite this whole term as the square root of 2 divided by pi this term becomes w and then the exponent becomes negative 2 w square times x square so now you see why I took the square root and then took the square so just so I could use the w sign and so this is the answer this is your probability density function and then if you were to try to graph this if you were to try to graph this function so let's try to write this out first so we found that our probability density function is equal to this term over here w e to the power of so this is our probability density probability density function and if you would try to graph this so at t equal to 0 this graph is going to look something like this so recall that the, uh, the t is going to be reflected by the w so recall that w is defined like this so when t is equal to 0 this whole thing is just equal to 0 so w is just equal to the square root of a just a constant so you can imagine uh, this whole term is basically just a function that is proportional to that looks something like e to the power of negative x e to the power of negative x square and this function looks something like this so it's going to peak uh, at the origin and then it's going to go back down but then as t uh, as time progresses as t goes on you can see that this denominator is going to become larger and larger so that means w is going to become smaller and smaller so when t becomes large this w is going to be small and so this number is going to be small. So you have this e term multiplied by a number that is going to be smaller and smaller. So it's when this number becomes smaller, it's just going to push the graph down. So it's going to push it down to something like this. So as, as t goes on, this whole graph is going to be more and more flat. So before there was a kind of like a spike, but then as time goes on, this graph is going to be become more and more flat. So this is how you can visualize this probability uh, density function graphically.